Mark Stephen, I'm going to be chairing today's events. Uh, welcome to our ninth annual Digital Innovation Summit in Aberdeen. And I have to say, it's really lovely to see so many people here in person today. I hope you're feeling happy and comfortable too, and that's great. Before we continue with the important matters, um, any Rangers fans in? <laughs> yeah. oh. Felt really, I mean, I'm not a football fan at all, but I genuinely felt really bad for you. Um, that, was, that was a tough game last night. So, having said that, it was really nice to see so many people carrying Union Jacks, happy to be in Europe. So, <laughs> Can I just say, uh, before we start, mobile phones, switch into silent, friends. Um, if it goes off during a presentation, you have to stand up and do a little dance, it's embarrassing. Toilets are located on this floor, it's just around the corner. Um, no fire alarm test is scheduled for today. If there is a loud noise, it is for real, please get out. Uh, do not uh, wander off, however, once you get out, because we need to look the count heads. All catering will take place in Conference Suite 2B, which is next door. Obviously, it's a live event, so take the chance to engage with your peers, build new connections, get involved in the sessions and question and answers and things like that. Um, there are solution providers from across the chain in the exhi exhibition area next door. I'd like to say a big thank you to all our sponsors, because without them, we genuinely couldn't run the events. Uh, do drop by and give them some time over the day. And if you are tweeting, please can you add the hashtag, hashtag digit north. Normally, Ray Bug comes up at this stage, uh, but with an irony which is inescapable, he's actually, his wife, he's okay at the moment, but his wife has tested positive for COVID. So despite the fact that this is his most popular event in the year, he can't be here, and frankly, he's as mad as a wet hen. So I will tell you what Digit's upcoming events are. Uh, Cloud First Summit's on the 16th of June. Um, that's a dynamic earth, that's an in-person event. FinTech, 15th September, in-person event with Digital Earth. Digit Expo, which is huge, um, is on the 10th of November. That's at the Exhibition Centre in Edinburgh. To book a place, just visit the Digit Registration next door um, in 2B. Right, that's the information done and dusted. Now onto the meat of the day. The opening session will consider digital transformation and organisational change in practice. I mean, these, these are words that are bandied about a lot. There, there are buzz phrases that are bandied about a lot. But the fact of the matter is, organisations have to go through this, it's a process, it is not easy, it's not straightforward. You know, there, there are a lot of hoops that need to be jumped through. Our first speaker is James McLean, who's the CIO for SSEM Transmission. They are doing a huge amount of work to digitise their transmission process. So, James, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yes, uh, we have transmission is an interesting business. I have 20 years oil and gas, and in November 19, in the middle of the lockdown, I changed jobs to take on this new role. And uh, to say that that was challenging probably is the biggest understatement, um, which I'll explain in a second. But transmission itself, what is the transmission? Um, I'm going to explain that, and then I'm going to talk about where we started slightly prior to me arriving, where we are, where we're going. Um, it's a five-year journey, and I'll explain why it's a five-year journey. And then how we're building ourselves and organizing ourselves. Um, there's huge challenges around hiring and sourcing of skills, as everyone's probably facing today, uh, but also uh, what we're trying to do with the business around our cultural alignment to deliver this transformation. So the first thing, what is transmission? Transmission is the part of the business that takes the electricity from the generator and then passes it off to distribution. So we are the motorways, we are the big towers and the substations. Distribution takes it from us and they are the B roads and the streets and they take it to your house. So we, we are in the big capital asset game from a, from a point of view. That's separate from renewables who generate, so they, are, they give us electricity as a separate standalone business as well as any other renewables business. We're a price control business, it's a monopoly. There's three businesses that, it's a bit like uh, National Rail, it's, we have three companies who transmit electricity in the UK, ourselves, Scottish Power and National Grid. So we have, we have to deliver this in a price controlled way, seven pounds as part of the electricity bill. Um, it's a time box, it started in April of last year and it finishes in April 26. So we get funding for that T2 period as we call it, the real T2. 
And so from a standing start, the digital program, here's what we want to do, time runs out, money runs out, we move on to the T3 period and we rinse repeat on the hamster wheel. We are the fastest growing transmission company. Some would say not just in Europe, uh, potentially the world. Uh, that's not for me to analyze, but that's the kind of feeling we have. This is driven by the huge growth in Scotland and the, the NOAA. That's the Network Operations Assessment. That's how do we position ourselves to deliver this electricity by 2030 as part of the energy policy. To meet that growth, the SSE transmission, we need to spend one billion pounds a year, every year to 2030. So you put that in the context of oil and gas, that's how big this business is becoming as part of the Scottish economy, the British economy. So this is large scale asset growth for, for Scotland. Scotland itself, uh, the recent licensing round, you see the future of Scotland in that slide, the windmills of various ways and turbines all in the sea. So you think about Aberdeen being an oil and gas, who's experts in, in offshore engineering, huge growth potential for this sector to, to be centered in, in Aberdeen as well. The growth in energy supply is going to be 10 gigawatts in 26, and by 2030 we need to be supplying 24 gigawatts. That's why we are having to invest that amount of money. As I say, it's an explosive growth. That's the background to my business, uh, and I think it's worth doing that just to set the context for where we're starting, where we're going, um, when we started, uh, transmission was split from another business unit called distribution, which I mentioned. So our digital maturity was extremely low. Um, and the reason for that was legacy. It was just a project business. It stood up the towers, it stood up the, 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 um, the, the substations. But it didn't actually have a real digital footprint. So when it split, it realized it needed to digitize. So when I joined in November of 2019, I had two IT staff and a digital strategy for five years. I had five, it's nine other business people who joined the team, um, but if it wasn't for Ian Dugan, who's here today, I don't think we would have got halfway forward. He was my font of wisdom of how SSE works. We have low um, system digitization and big ambition, so we are putting in our asset management system. We just replatformed that in March to the cloud. We're putting in ArcGIS for visualization of the network. We're putting in web, a huge program, so I'll cover that in a second. Um, the submission, we got awarded 45 million pounds for that five year period. Um, and that's to do with, we've got a series of outputs we need to deliver. So off-gen polices to make sure we've not just asked for money and, and making it up as we go along. We've got clear out outputs we need to deliver. The team of 12, as I mentioned, uh, what are we doing? How are we doing it? How are we ramping up? Well, the time box begins, go. And, and so that's been the part of the challenge of organizational change, business transformation, and, and really getting this whole thing tied together with our business leaders. To accelerate that, we took the decision very quickly. The original plan had called for on-premise IT. I, I turned up and being in charge, I just went, nope, we're going cloud. And we're going to go cloud first to SaaS. We'll go cloud internally to our own Azure. But I cannot spend the next seven years, six, five years building TIN. Um, so where are we? Um, 18 months in, we've now hired more people than I've ever done in my life. And I'm not finished yet. Coming from oil and gas, and I'm used to the conversations where times are tough and sorry we need to let you go. Uh, I am, we're in permanent hire mode. Um, never, never seen it like this. We're building a very strong team, both in digital and operations technology, because part of my accountability is also the national infrastructure piece as well. We are, had to stand up project service capability, operational capability, service management, finance control, project control from three people and, and nine business people. We're putting in core systems, as I mentioned. Maximo is our chosen tool for asset management. Um, we're replatforming our web, so that's a whole learning curve for part of our business. We're putting in big, large capital project systems. We haven't picked them yet, but things like Aviva, Smart Plant, et cetera, we need one of those to drive that billion pound spend efficiently and, and transparently. So it's huge, big investments. Um, the service delivery function, you, you know, we're building and operating. And that's why I call it build and fly the airplane at the same time. We can't wait to have all of this in place. It's rough, it's someone's holding on to the engine while someone's holding onto a wing, and we're, we're making progress. Um, 
one of the things that I do with my team, particularly on the ops side, is let's make sure we've got the processes, make sure we've got the, the operational handovers right, make sure we've got the disaster recovery. Get the basics right and you begin to run a, a strong operation while the project's team is just trying to build, build, build. So five years of build is what we're in. Where are we going? By the end of um, 24, 25, we think we'll be at about 45. By the end of the T2 period, I think we're aiming to be at 56. And that's a combination, again, of digital and OT. Um, we expect to have delivered a, a substantial part of our uh, program. As I say, we're, we're now, Maximo is running, but was running, we're now putting in time, time management, we're putting in, uh, in inspection management, because everything was currently sitting in legacy spreadsheets. So real digitization of our operation as well. Strategic plans. Um, halfway through T2, we need, need, need to plan for T3. Because the, the, the way the, the hamster wheel works, you have to submit it at least 18 months prior to the end of T2. So you have to make an assumption you're going to be successful in delivery of your plans, and then you have to start building your plans for funding requests for the next cycle. It's, um, it's a crazy business, I, I can tell you that. The growth of transmission is vast. We started in 2019 with 400 people. We're now at 1,000. We think by the end of the decade, it could be potentially double that. So, so I'm trying to build and also deal with massive growth. So how we structure ourselves to try and get there, deliver the delivery machine is the way I, I describe it, but also how we're managing our services, how we're providing services to that delivery machine. Across the top, you see, first of all, the directorates. So I'm on the executive committee as a CIO, which is really great and powerful because I can actually talk to each of the directors as a peer. How do I help you with your transformation? My MD, Rob McDonald, is just superbly on board with what we're trying to do. He knows we can't grow without this digitization. So down on the left, you see each of the directorates has its horizontal. I have the whole picture. And what we're trying to do is deliver this, the horizontal strategy while we worry about the dependencies and the co-dependencies of, well, when that system goes live, this horizontal can then begin to exploit. So to do that, we've got a digital program manager who sits above, driving the delivery. We've got a head of IT operations who's supplying services, including people, as well as making sure we're getting the right commercial contracts. And then when it gets handed back over, run in place. I've got a new head of analytics, again, providing services to the delivery machine. I've, got, I've just hired a lead solution architect last month. Um, so again, it's, it's a service model. And, and to me, that's the only way that's going to work. My leadership team has to see the whole picture, provide services, while the digital uh, program manager literally keeps his head down and, and fires out the results. Um, at the end of that rainbow, you see vendors, and that's a really important part of what we do. We don't have all that knowledge. We're hiring. We've got gaps. So a strategic relationship with some tier one providers as well as niche providers. We, we went out and tendered for digital frameworks of suppliers so that we don't need to keep going retendering. We've got capacity to spend at speed. So the, the whole model is there to deliver this program and then, as I say, build and fly, and then finally fly. And then T3 is our projects. It's almost a steady state. So one of the biggest challenges is hiring and outsourcing for us. Um, inheriting this model, uh, one of the key things is uh, what's the staffing strategy? So the approach we're taking is we're absolutely only going to hire in what we regard as the differentiating service roles. And that could be someone who's a very strong service manager, because that's as equally differentiating as a business analyst who's got many years experience running an OT network. We want those roles that are going to have a deep understanding of the business first, outcomes, the technical roles, we recognize we need analytics, we recognize we need cyber. When it gets to some of the infrastructure, we're talking about ITOT convergence strategies. What are the roles we think we need to staff versus provided by a supplier? So we're developing that, literally got workshops in the next four weeks to phase out some of that planning as well. There's so many meetings I'm in where it's what we're doing next, what we're doing next to keep this plan rolling. The market's horrific, I'm sure you all recognize. It's, a, it's, a, it's an employee's market, and the rates for some of these roles have just exploded. We're trying to hire uh, data analytics people, and, and being competitive is a real challenge. Um, we have an outsourced arrangement with, in, within SSE. It's, it's group-wide. So how do we leverage that provision? How do we get the best from it? How do we sometimes avoid its underperformance, like anyone would do? Um, but also, in terms of outsource of services, 
SAS, PaaS, that's all part of our makeup. I don't want anything on-prem, and if we have on-prem, where's the roadmap to get it off-prem? Because that does a number of things for my business. One, it gives me flexibility of scale. The second thing it gives me is the ability to be resilient, whether geolocated or in terms of disaster recovery, I'm out of the tin box backup game as much as possible. And that's not, it's a, it's a service I must have, but it's not a service I should staff and, and, and worry about. We have a cloud data platform. We literally went live in March with our, with our platform. So we're literally building what many companies have had for several years. We also have, as I mentioned previously, a vendor strategy. We want to accelerate the insight. We don't have everybody, we don't have all the answers. We have the plans, we have the money, but we don't have the knowledge. So we lean heavily into our vendor supply chain to give us that insight, exercise fast delivery, whether we go to agile methods, a mixture of waterfall projects and agile methods. But I want long-term relationships. I want people to understand where I'm going and why it's important. I don't, we will take niche players for assignments and, and, and that, but, but to me, it's about the long game uh, right out to 2030. And, um, you know, we're shifting very heavily from a traditional waterfall as a whole business and moving towards uh, full agile. For my operating model, as you saw previously, um, we did value streams, but we're not going to product lines yet because the products don't exist. So what I'm trying to do with the business directors is get them into the mindset of we have value streams. Once we have products, probably towards the T3 period, we'll start looking at do we need product owners? Do we need to move to sprint cycles? and move more to the exploitation of the Agile gives you. Right now, we're just in bare metal build, as I've suggested. So culture and alignment, and it's both within my team and also within the business wide, uh, wider business. Leadership commitment, we have that in spades. I, I, I've never met a management team who's so desperate to be digitized. Um, as a member of the executive committee, it's, it's really great to be able to talk to directors about how do we change your experience, how do we make you more efficient. It's very much outcome focused because of the value stream approach. We're not talking about true ROI in the sense of how, what the efficiencies are. How am I changing my business? How is this going to make us better? And moving on to that value proposition and, and, uh, and the outcomes. Target setting, um, we need to deliver at pace. Um, we, need to be government, we need to get the right controls as a new green organization. We need to run that correctly. So we've got a lot of KPIs we use to measure where we are with our performance. Um, organization readiness, that's not just IT. One of the things, obviously going from three to 30, how do you create an identity? How do you create a community of digital workers? But broader than that, how do we get with our business leaders who've never had a, a dedicated IT function and they start relying on us as a, as a formal part of the business? So it, getting that over the line in terms of organizational readiness, organizational cultural acceptance is, is, is something that we're, we're just doggedly doing and we do it through lots of communication. Creating that data culture, we have data governance board with the directorates, for example, and great buy-in. I've got a really good head of uh, data strategy who's just working that. And the parallels with oil and gas, for those in the room, we're, we're now having to create the same sort of uh, national archive and data, open data access and such like. And so there's lots of bodies in the industry that we need to be part of. But that allows us to really embed that culture of data first drives data decisions. The systems are just the thing we use to get to the data. Um, so it's, it's, it's really good. I'll, I'll speed up a little bit, but sustain. Uh, digital should become embedded, and it's not just in IT, but across the business. And that's something that we really focus on. One of our directorates, our customers, we just replatform. We're in the process of platforming, replatforming their website to a big enterprise uh, tool set. As part of that, they've gone on an incredibly fast journey to where they now have a product owner. We're not yet going to move to sprints, but within 18 months or so, I think they'll be in the, the proper agile world. So th they, they've really got that embedded idea of this is going to make our world so much better. And finally, just showing you what we're trying to do with this. Offgem themselves have clearly dedicated, said that the fastest route to net zero is digitization and data. And they've got a data strategy that it gets refreshed regularly. Um, and so the, the commitment on this whole utility sector is, it's, it's a bit like where oil and gas was 10 years ago. We've got to do better. We've got to be digital. We've got to innovate. And we've got to get these systems stood up so that we actually can run at pace and also operate cost effectively. That's me.
obviously trying to digitize a business is one thing, trying to digitize public services is quite another. Um, our next two speakers are going to operate as a tag team. Steve Rowd is Chief Officer for Digital Technology, and Sandy Scott is People Development Manager for Aberdeen City Council. So, over to you, Ben. So, uh, be on. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, as it was mentioned, my name is uh, Steve Rowe, Chief Officer of Digital Technology. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Sandy Scott today uh, to talk about the work we've been doing in terms of building a multi-agency digital business platform. So, I wanted to start off by framing the work that's going on in terms of the vision, um, which is for Aberdeen to be a sustainable city uh, in which all citizens can prosper. Uh, no great surprise there, and, and that was reiterated by the new council, which um, uh, administration formed yesterday. Uh, but in order to deliver on that, one of our key strategic outcomes has to be the removal of uh, excess demand, particularly failure demand, which we see coming through our doors at about 45% of, of all our available capacity. Uh, and that leads to a move to prevention through improved prediction. The response we want uh, will be facilitated through better use of digital services and data, uh, and that enables community empowerment and independence, as well as creating a stronger customer voice in decision making. Underpinning the vision, there are three pillars around how Aberdeen City Council will shape our services through transformation. So we look at the nature of work, which is that um, how we do our business and uh, that move to prevention that I spoke about. The workplace of the future, which is the martini moment uh, for some of us that are old enough to remember those adverts, but that's uh, right tools, right data, uh, and right setting to allow our workforce to be at their most effective. And of course, the workforce of the future that Sandy's going to cover um, shortly. Needless to say, as a council, we can't deliver transformation of that scale on our own. Uh, and the Aberdeen City Council Transformation Programme is only one part of that whole system change approach. Along with our partners, we've established a multi-agency transformation management group. It's a very snappily titled MAT MG, uh, rolls off the tongue. Uh, and we've also <coughs> collaboratively, well, excuse me, collaboratively with those partner agencies to continuously identify areas where we can drive that uh, agenda of early intervention and prevention through the management of demand and the design of specific services. So the governance for that does sit with Aberdeen City Council uh, and our chief executive chairs it. But a key requirement of all of that work is to understand all of the investment that we have available to us through the lens of demand prevention. Uh, that will be the key to unlocking. And once we've understood that, then digital and data become the key. Transformation will ensure that public resources are committed to the right areas of need across that multi-agency landscape. Now, to bring a bit of shape to that, um, we've used this model, which is a conceptual model from, from Gartner originally, uh, to understand how we map that demand across the multi-agency landscape. So the three uh, key areas are Aberdeen City Council, bottom right-hand corner, and then moving anti-clockwise, we have our multi-agency partners, our customers, the connected world, uh, and then all of that activity feeding through the data platform, which acts as a decision engine supporting event-driven responses. We brought that model in probably two years ago, uh, and that's helped us with a lot of our technology adoption and decisions that we've made since then. So relatively well developed in three areas. Uh, so if we look at customer, we've done a fair bit of work there in terms of getting those core components in place. Um, our data maturity continues to grow uh, very largely at the moment, uh, focused on that um, descriptive analytic piece, but we're moving very quickly to predictive analytics and hopefully to prescriptive shortly thereafter. And lastly, our application development, which I'm going to speak about uh, a little bit later on. I'm not going to stand here uh, and say that we're done, because we're not. Uh, but we've got a portfolio mapped out that will form the basis of our delivery over the next few years. Uh, and focus on that city vision and, and the three pillars that I spoke about earlier on are the things that are going to ensure that we can alter course, but stay focused on the right outcomes for the city, city and our citizens. But in order to be successful, we've also got to challenge the technical and financial legacies. 
So, like a lot of organizations, and I think we heard it uh, from the previous speaker, we have a technology sprawl that is made up of point solutions that have been designed in the past to solve a single business problem. Now, that landscape needs to be tackled through uh, twin pressures of both cost and technology rationalization. So moving to a position where we've got fewer key technologies uh, and we take a focus on designing business solutions instead of procuring applications. So at the moment, our cost uh, element is focused on removing those costs through cloud adoption uh, and also significant use of robotic process automation to create people efficiencies, but also to uh, improve process. And simplifying the application estate uh, will progress as, as we uh, identify new opportunities uh, coming from those drivers for change on the left-hand side of that diagram there. That, to me, is, is the slow burn. That's the evolutionary path. We'll have to wait for some things to fall out, whether that's contracts or whether that's business maturity. But we've also got an opportunity, I think, to drive at innovation uh, and taking a similar approach in terms of those twin-track developments uh, to data and application maturity we want to revolutionize areas of our business too. So at the moment, uh, we're replatforming our social work practices to exploit some of those core technologies I spoke about. Uh, and rather foolishly, we selected that use case because it was the most complicated one we could think of, uh, but also because it gave us a really good test of those platform components that we've chosen. The main thing for me is that the new system is built by professional social workers for their own use. It leverages dynamics, SharePoint, Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI to drive automation of uh, social work cases. Some of the key design criteria we had were input data once, streamline the incoming referrals process and take out that demand, greater consistency and more accurate report reporting. Uh, and that will give us a significant benefit in terms of reducing delays and providing service to our citizens. The system also allows for automation of some of the, the, the more menial work. And we take all of the activity that's applied to a social work case, we pull that through into calendars, and then we take it from there and we put that along with warnings and alerts into a loan worker application. And that capability that we have to use both real-time data and legacy data means that our statutory returns and our feeds through to other agencies can be automated enabling that reduction in demand and improved prediction of service need that I spoke about. So while I think the technology part of what we've done so far has been ambitious uh, and significantly challenging, um, it's probably only been possible because of the good work and the strong work that's been done around the people development, and that's mirrored it as we've gone along. So for that, I'm going to hand over to Sandy. <coughs> Thanks, Steve. Hi everyone, my name is Sandy Scott and I'm the People Development Manager for Aberdeen City Council. So as Steve says, um, I was really fortunate at Aberdeen City Council to be brought into the conversations on digital change really early doors. So I feel really fortunate that the investment in digital change at Aberdeen City Council has been matched by equal and equivalent investment in the people side of change at Aberdeen City Council. So that's what I'll talk to you about in a bit more detail just now and happy to go into any more details during the Q&A. So, Aberdeen City Council is an enormously diverse organisation. We have 8,000 employees, 1,000 job roles. There's not a single aspect of people's lives in Aberdeen that we don't touch on in some way. And what drives all that behind the scenes is the, the people of Aberdeen City Council. So implementing digital change across, um, across a council um, was a massive challenge, requiring not just um, internal upskilling, but upskillings of our partners as well because there's no point in delivering digital transformation ourselves if we're not bringing our partners with us. So how did it start? So back in 2019, pre-pandemic, all we had to our name was OneDrive. That's all we were working with. Um, we went into partnership with um, Microsoft for an 18-month period. Um, and the challenge, as they put it to us, was, was quite simple. Get 4,000 office-based employees to move their data voluntarily from something called Share Drive to, from, from shared drives, which they were quite familiar with, over to SharePoint, which was an entirely new concept to them. Get them using a new bit of technology called Microsoft Teams. Get them collaborating and sharing their data in an open way that they weren't familiar with. Um, and get them working in this, this new app. So an enormous challenge. So how's it going? 
we kind of nailed it. Um, within about a 10 month period, we'd successfully migrated all of our data to the cloud. We had team sites established for every single cluster and service in the council. We had an army of digital champions leading the way. We had a crack squad of super champs training their peers. We had a program established for senior managers at an executive and middle management level to ensure they were leading the way and cleaning the task. And we had Teams, SharePoint, Yammer, and Stream fully established and adopted across the organization. And all of that was achieved by the time the pandemic hit, which meant that when it came to the enforced working from home, Aberdeen City Council was in a really strong position to do that, meaning we were able to continue delivering critical services to the people of Aberdeen. So since that time, we've then been able to expand and scale out our approach, moving towards multi-agency approach to, to digital transformation. So the way we did that was we invited our partners to join our super, super champion community. So we had the super champion community established by that point. We then invited them to donate their super champions so we could bring them on board. The um, structure of SharePoint and Microsoft Teams that would successfully landed in the council, we then duplicated across to our partners in the Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership and showed them how to, we, we shared our digital resources with them and they were able to, um, to replicate the structure there. We had an open approach to resourcing and knowledge sharing, knowing how much we had benefited from that partnership with Microsoft and knowing how open they were about sharing their intellectual property with us, meant we were then able to share that with our partners. And it's meant we've been able to do things like presenting our approach to the digital office for public sector organizations all across Scotland and share with them the, the work that we're doing. And we've also rolled out something called Request a Guest, which has enabled us to um, work with partners to bring any single external partner or individual into our Microsoft Teams environment and collaborate with us in exactly the same way as any other employee could. <clears throat> so whenever people ask us, how, how did you do this? Like, what's the silver bullet we can put in place that will enable us to achieve the same thing? The bad news is there's no, there's no one single thing that achieved it. What we did have was an eight-pronged approach to implementing uh, the change of, of the new technology. And I'll chat you through how we did that in practice. And again, I can go into more detail during the Q&A. So practically, what did we do? We started at the top, executive sponsorship, getting directors, chief officers absolutely on board, owning it within their service areas, not just... Um, talking the talk, but walking the walk as well. So really providing them with extremely practical resources that they could use to share and communicate in their own areas. We took them through a really practical show and tell. Come on guys, here's the basics of how to use Microsoft Teams. And we got them fronting campaigns as well. Communications were absolutely critical. And in most instances, the question was always, who's the preferred sender of this communication? Does it need to come from Sandy and people development? Absolutely not. It needs to come from people it's from somebody that people naturally recognize as their leader. Training has obviously been absolutely critical to our approach, and I'll talk in the next slide with a bit more detail about how we did that. Employee voice, giving people the opportunity to let you know what they think about the changes that are taking place, to ask their questions and to answer them transparently, and moving to that hive mind of communication where people ask questions in the open and they are answered in the open by their peers, really reduced demand, not just on digital technology, but on people development as well. Empowering managers, having a full program in place for our middle managers and line managers so that they are able to coach their employees on the front line, that they're able to reinforce the behaviours and, and walk the walk. They're role modelling the behaviours that we need them to show. Co-creation, giving people the opportunity to build with us the environments that they'll then be working in. So giving them the opportunity to co-create to co their Microsoft Teams sites and the apps that they'll then be using. So our digital champions were absolutely critical in the development of the Request the Guest app. Measurement, at every point along the way, measuring what we're doing, both qualitative and quantitative. So we can see from, uh, through Microsoft 365, we can see what our adoption stats are looking, looking like, but also kind of getting into the detail of how are people feeling about it as well? What are the barriers they're experiencing? Are their managers are on board? Are their managers supporting them? And ultimately, where we're always trying to get to with this is a self-managing workforce that no longer require any kind of interfickering from people development, that are no longer reliant on an IT help desk, that they're doing it themselves, they're teaching themselves, and they're teaching others as well. So spotlight on training. I want to just chat a little bit about the multi-pronged approach we took to, to training our workforce that's been so successful. 
So we have the traditional instructor-led approaches, um, and in a lot of instances after uh, March 2020, we obviously moved digital, so we moved to a webinar-type format. Um, Virtual-led courses, so we can share with people all the resources that are available on YouTube and through Microsoft, so they can watch videos in their own time, teach themselves how to use the tools. Um, Self-directed learning, we can make e-learning available. But where we had the biggest bang for our buck, where we had more success than anything else and reached employees in a way we would never be able to, 8,000 employees all across the workforce, was through um, our Digital Champion programme. And it worked a little bit like this. So with our Digital Super Champion programme, we, or, or, or me or a member of my team, would deliver a core bit of training in 15 minutes to 50 Digital Super Champions all across the organisation. This morning, guys, I'm going to show you how to boot up Microsoft Teams. Super simple. 15 minutes of demonstration, 15 minutes of uh, questions from the super champs. Those 50 super champs across the organization would then deliver that exactly the same bit of training to their peers. They had absolute autonomy to tailor that slide deck to suit the needs of themselves and suit the needs of their services. Because a bit of learning that lands really well in legal might land completely different with environmental health officers or with um, building services um, or, or janitors in schools. So they had absolute autonomy to, to tailor that slide deck to suit their own environment and also to challenge us, the people development team, on how the slide deck was coming across. So we were co-creating the learning with them. Another great benefit of having pe um, people's peers delivering the training on our behalf was it's in people's own language. It's, it's speaking to them in a way they understand that really resonates with them. It's someone they know and trust. The additional benefit of that is it then means we get direct feedback into the sort of project team about how things are landing. So top things that made a difference, clear direction and tasks for our super champions primarily, but for the whole workforce as well, and doing it bit by bit. Recruiting super champions who want to be there, um, Tears are always better than voluntold. If people are forced to be there, they'll drop out really quickly. <coughs> Sponsorship and support from directors and chief officers was absolutely critical. Reward and recognition for our super champions who were going over and above, giving them the opportunity to try out the latest tech so they got their laptops quicker than anyone else. They were um, giving feedback and working hand in tech, hand in glove with digital technology. And visible, visibility and clarity, making sure that people could see exactly who their super champs were and making sure that they were front and centre of all the comms we put out. So that, that's it, and a whistle stopped here. Thanks. Back to you, Thank thanks. You Our next speaker is Tanya Knowles, uh, Head of Digital Services for North Sea Transition Authority. And what Tanya wants to talk about is how digital is contributing to the offshore transition. So, Tanya, over to you. everyone. Um, so I will talk a little bit about our organization and then I'll talk a little bit about our offshore infrastructure reporting process. So how many of you, show of hands, have actually heard of the North Sea Transition Authority? Oh, ooh, I'm, I'm impressed. How about the Oil and Gas Authority? Okay, so I guess actually a lot of you then know that we changed our name in March um, from the Oil and Gas Authority to the North Sea Transition Authority. And I'm in a room with many IT, digital and data professionals, so you'll know that wasn't easy for us. Um, so our, um, our purpose is to regulate and influence the oil, gas and carbon storage industries um, and help to drive the energy transition. Uh, we recognise that the UK continental shelf um, has huge potential in terms of energy and carbon abatement. Why did we go through all that effort to change our name? Well, we, um, it was uh, to encompass our evolving role in the energy transition. So in 2021, we changed our strategy to put net zero at the heart of what we do alongside stewarding production. So we have a role, uh, monitoring emissions, uh, the permitting and licensing authority for carbon storage, um, a net zero test for new developments alongside stewarding production. So uh, our digital strategy uh, enables that to happen um, and it's at the heart of what I, myself and my team do. Um, and we have a five-year digital strategy, which has five pillars, 
um, that uh, underpins that. Uh, the, our powers, the Energy Act and Petroleum Act probably don't seem like the most interesting reading, but they are very interesting to us because they give us the power and the ability to require data to be reported to us. And that enables us to sit on top of a load of data that we can derive insights from and add value to industry. Uh, but we can also share a huge amount of that data in an open way. And we've done that in early action through our open data platform, through our national data repository, and through our website, making data available to industry, to academia, to government. And uh, we've had some early outcomes. We've done some fantastic analysis. And we have improved compliance. And that's not just in terms of data quality, but also our relationship with industry uh, around data management and data quality and the perception around it as well. So talking a bit about our digital energy platform, it's publicly accessible. We've got downloadable data, cloud-based, authoritative. <coughs> and we integrate with other data sources, which has been identified as one of the key things for the energy transition to integrate in an effective way with other government organizations to share our data. Uh, for example, one, one huge thing is other users of the sea. It's getting crowded out there. How do, we, how do we do spatial planning? So one example to draw your attention to with the energy transition and our mature uh, geographic information systems platform is one of our many mapping applications is a collaboration between ourselves and the Crown Estate and Crown Estate Scotland. So we pulled together uh, all the lease agreements for the UK continental shelf onto one map. Um, and that's uh, driven by APIs, so requires not very much maintenance. And that has been hugely popular, way more popular than we thought it would be. Uh, and that's because I think there are a lot of people out there who don't know how to put those things on a map and we did it for them, and now they can make decisions. Now they can see how far away things are from each other. So we do that through simple uh, applications like that, but it requires that foundation of having those APIs to share, having them um, always up to date, and not having to maintain them. So as I mentioned, we sit on a pile of fantastic data and we derive insights from that. We do a benchmarking exercise with operators every year, uh, which drives positive action through really uh, useful conversation. We support our internal teams with the exploration for hydrocarbon and CCS reservoirs and transparency. So um, recently, we relaunched our energy pathfinder application, which has details of uh, energy and energy transition projects, developments, tenders for the supply chain to get involved and have uh, early sight of uh, those projects. So moving on to the uh, infrastructure reporting process. So uh, why did we do it and what is it? So as a background, um, infrastructure, offshore infrastructure, has been collected into one data set for quite a while. Uh, and its primary purpose was for um, fishermen at sea to help them avoid, or to make sure they avoided hazards and uh, were aware of safety zones. Um, it had quite an old process for data collection, which involved coordinates in spreadsheets, and it was quite manual. So we couldn't afford to do that. When we, uh, when we acquired this data and this process, we knew we had to automate it and we knew it had to be uh, in good shape for all the other uses that we now have for that data. So decommissioning and repurposing primarily. And that requires more attributes, that requires more information, potentially it requires other file formats and we need a really quality uh, system of record to hang all that off. So we aim to use um, automation um, to save us time so that we could focus on those things. 
and we also created efficiencies, report spatial data to us in spatial formats. So I think there's a bit of a superhero theme going on uh, in the presentations. Um, so what expertise did we require? Well, it wasn't easy because we did have to pull together uh, a couple of people uh, with a couple of different areas of expertise. We all had to fit it into this one process that we'd never done before. And then we had to get over 40 organizations to give us data. So, um, but we brought together subject matter expertise. As uh, a lot of you will know, offshore infrastructure is not simple. There's a huge amount to know about it. There's a lot of nuances. Uh, compliance, so we wanted, um, we needed uh, to be able to put together documentation about the form and manner we expect things in uh, and to understand whether we can actually collect this. Uh, we needed somebody with a thorough understanding of our powers. Data management, to understand that data quality um, and where we needed to look at the data quality, what issues did we have, and as I mentioned, automation and GIS. So how did it go? Well, we did make numerous improvements. We implemented 36 basic automated checks, and that included automated emails. So you submit your data, uh, our process runs over it, it emails you, it says, yes, you passed, or no, you did this, this, and this wrong, please resubmit. Uh, we had over, uh, we had 110 companies who we expected to respond to us. Yes, I'm responsible for infrastructure. No, I'm not. I don't have to report anything. Over 40 of them were, so we had uh, them reporting to us. A lot of types of infrastructure. We held two workshops beforehand to uh, introduce the new process to them and to allow them to ask questions of us. And yes, it was painful. We did have over 40 resubmissions. And, um, but uh, the positive in that was that we had really great um, engagement from industry. Uh, we remained open, they remained open. We made mistakes, they made mistakes. And we worked out those teething problems and we delivered uh, a data set. Uh, some of the improvements, uh, or one of the improvements was both, uh, so we're in the middle of a reporting process right now. This one was in October, our first one. In the first one, we had a testing period. I think probably six organizations took us up on it um, to test their submissions, see if that worked. This time we had 23 out of the 51 companies. So that's been fantastic. It helps us, it helps them. Uh, right. So our future plans are to include more attributes. As I say, we're solidifying that data set. We're getting that data quality up. And when we do, we'll include more attributes. We've already got our decommissioning team telling us what we need to collect and what we need to share out um, and what massive uh, improvements that could drive. Tighter definitions. Uh, we can always improve our definitions. There are always many, many interpretations of the documentation we put out. Uh, we have uh, greater data quality now, but there's still a long way to go. As we go through these uh, reporting rounds, we learn which checks we can implement, which ones we can automate. And as I said, industry is awash with that subject matter expertise. Um, people know a lot about offshore infrastructure, and they're willing to share that with us. So we are looking to have greater industry involvement in this process to really improve that data set and that process. And also submit, um, automate the submissions more so that we can save industry time and we can save our time and really focus on the things that matter, that data quality. And so uh, what I did forget to say is how this actually is innovative. So we've had positive uh, feedback from organizations uh, because we are driving innovation in those organizations. Those people that, and that expertise that you saw that we had to collect together, they needed a reason to collect their expertise together. They needed to do it, but they needed a reason. 
uh, we are ensuring, um, through our sort of pull for data, they are having to improve their own processes and get their own data in ship shape. Um, we are creating the conditions for innovation through, um, through providing a solid data set where you can, that you can base your energy transition decisions on. Um, and we have revolutionized a really old process. Um, so I hope you'll agree that that is innovative work that uh, is really has the potential to have a huge impact on the energy transition. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, um, and the last speaker in this particular section, and I should point out there is a chance to ask questions of any of the speakers afterwards. We'll have live microphones in the conference room. There's also uh, a thing called Slido app, uh, which we'll be able to sort of scan a QR code and submit questions that way. Um, Malcolm Brown is an energy subject matter expert from the SUNY, and Malcolm wants to talk about how, I mean, data is precious, how do you go about stewarding that data? So, Malcolm, over to you. Okay. No? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was unexpected. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, just going to get a quick poll in the room here. Hands up if you know what a floppy disk is. That's not too bad. Hands up um, if you can remember how we archived them. Okay, not many people. Right. So, 25 years ago, Floppy disks were the state of the art for digital media. And what we did was we followed suit with what we did with paper records. And anything that was critical, we stuck in a safe, a fireproof safe in our offices. And then one day, someone discovered following a fire that when they went to retrieve their floppy disks and read their data back, there was no content. And the reason being that although fireproof safes stop things from going on fire, especially paper, um, the magnetic media inside the floppy disk would be wiped with the temperature. And so we had to find new ways to innovate and protect our data. And then things started to move on, right? Data started to grow. We had to find new ways to protect data. We had to evolve, okay? And as we got new expectations and demands, we produced a solution that involved archiving of that data digitally. And then we would take copies of that data and move that data off-site. But today's expectations are much, much different from those we had 20 years ago. And the technologies and solutions that we invented back then are no longer fit for purpose today. Today, we've got exploding file data. We've got masses of survey data coming to us. We've got new high-res video techniques, which include thermal imaging and ultrasound scanning those attributes integrated into the products, and that makes those file sizes much, much bigger. Our data sets are growing. You know, 20 years ago, we were talking gigabytes. 10 years ago, we started talking terabytes. Today, we're talking petabytes of data. And before long, we're going to be moving to exabytes and beyond. So moving that data around, sharing it across our global communities with our peers in other locations, even within our own country, even within our own towns, we have multiple offices. And how we access that data becomes a challenge. We do things like this. We build data silos in different regional locations so that our local people have access to the data they need. And then someone decides, oh, we need to share that data with someone else. So we, we copy it out, we stick it in an airplane, we fly it around the world, or we build remote access solutions across wide area networks with high latency and try and visualize the data remotely. But the further away you go from those locations, the poorer that infrastructure becomes and the, the responses engineers feel are, are diminished. This is the kind of a typical environment we have now for looking after our data. We use multiple vendors who all specialize in different things and the way they do things. Um, we have maybe replication going on between locations into 
data silos. We're still archiving stuff out to tape. But the problem is that as our data sets have become so large, when we're into petabytes, we can no longer do a full backup in a short period of time to accommodate that data. And so what happens is the interval between those copies of the full sets of data grow. There may be up to a year, two years between the last full backup. And so then we rely on snapshots in between to fill the gaps. But that's not efficient in today's world. We need to think again. We're at that point now where we need to re-innovate the way we do things. Just like we did 20 years ago. We came up with a solution fit for purpose at that time. We need a solution and solutions that are fit for purpose today. We need to go to some form of single master file storage where all of our data from all of our organization, regardless of where they're located, in one single repository and as part of a cloud-first approach. We also need to make that data accessible to those that need it at the edge so they get local file data performance. There's no point in having a solution which just repeats the problems of the past. You know, if you, if you have a, a, a file data set in the cloud and you're expecting someone from the United States to access a data set in Australia, that's not going to be very efficient. It's not going to be timely. It's not going to give you performance. You need to be able to distribute your data to those people regionally and locally using edge appliances of some sort. And likewise, we need to be taking the shortest path possible to get new data into our systems. You know, we need to think about out, out offshore in our drilling rigs, in our hydro plants out in the middle of nowhere, on survey vessels out at sea, getting that data straight in through our current connections that we have, regardless of the bandwidth and the quality, into our master file repository as quickly and efficiently as possible, eliminating all the data copying processes that we use today in between so that you know your data is authentic, you know your data is sound and safe and kept in an immutable store. And in doing so, we can create a golden master of all our data. That first object that you copy in, whether it be from merger and acquisition, whether it be from a survey vessel, or from one of your engineers sitting at his desk doing his job, that first copy becomes your gold standard. That is where your money lies. And then all the work that's done in between is then stored immutably as snapshots or current file versions within that. It needs to be indestructible, so we do things with it like encrypt it and make it safe. We protect it. The SUNY offer a solution that covers most of these things today, but we need to go further. There are things that we can do to enhance that, to make it better. Now, here's a big fact. 80% on average of our data in all our organizations is unstructured. We're very good at looking after the structured data in our databases and stewarding it. But our unstructured data is where our vulnerabilities lie. We need to start thinking about how we protect that data in a different way. Having continuous file versioning is a solution for that. You have your golden master, you have time interval snapshots that can be taken down to seconds so that your recovery points become very, very short. Your time to get back to operating in the event of something disastrous happening is circumvented. You don't have to wait days and weeks for you to go back to your full backup that I spoke about earlier and then do all those recovery points in between. You need to be able to go back point in time to minutes and seconds before the event took place. We need to think of a multi-layered security strategy. Now, we've spent the last five, six, seven years working very hard on mitigating threat defense from the perimeter into our organizations. We're very good at that. We've put AI with autonomous response in our networks to look at unusual characteristics. 
We've added sophisticated AI monitoring in our email flow to try and eliminate phishing and spear phishing. We've put antivirus on things for nearly two decades as well. But these solutions in themselves are not enough because I don't know if a lot of you remember what happened in 2012 with Stuxnet. That kind of solution that the threat actors came up with for themselves to um, attack our systems and our SCADA systems and our control networks offshore, they simulate humans. That's what they try and do. They don't try and take control of the machines. They try and use the human interfaces to do that work. And now they're employing those same tactics in our own networks. It only takes one event, one thing to go wrong, where someone gets compromised on your network. And nothing can appear to be damaged. Nothing can set off an alert in your current security system. What they do is they simulate what that end user does. It look at your file system. That user has access rights probably to a lot of data in your organization. If they can take control of the file system without setting off any alerts, they can modify files. And if they can modify files, they can encrypt those files. Now, I know some of you here today have already experienced the, the damage that ransomware can do. Some of you have also experienced the events from other types of malware, like dropper wipers, where they, it, something drops on a file server and it instantly wipes the content. Those are disasters for an organization, losing all your data or access to it. But one of the things that we can do is develop solutions that are baked into our file data platforms and our solutions that we're using now. We can look for those changing file characteristics right on those edge appliances where your end users do all their work, knowing that the stuff in the cloud is protected immutably and it cannot be changed. Your edge appliance can be damaged if you can detect, monitor, and mitigate that and stop it from spreading quickly right in the file system itself, when you go to do your recovery, you've got all the analytics you need at your disposal to say, this is when that happened, this is where it came from, this is how it got in. And at that point in time, I can go back five minutes and say, this is my recovery point. I can turn the clock back five minutes one minute, 20 seconds, if you have enough immutable objects in there. And in doing so, you can get your business back to work in minutes. You're not going to wait days, weeks, months. And in some case, unfortunately, one of our uh, government bodies in Scotland are still waiting over a year later to get all the data back, and the likelihood of that is um, not going to happen. right? So getting our RTOs and RPOs down to the shortest time possible is, should be where we're striving to get to. So what all of this means is the sanctity of data. That is the one thing in our organizations we should be protecting. It means putting your data first and acknowledging that if something fatally happens to your company's intellectual property housed within years of file data, you're putting your entire organization at risk. And I'm going to leave you with one question. What do we do about it? Thank you. Thank you. I like the idea of immutable objects, which kind of reminds me of paleontology, of looking at stuff in the fossil records, mm. actually having fixed points and things, or even yeah. archaeology context. Mm. You know, if you know where something came from and there's something older below it and younger above it, you, you can date things. It's a clever idea. Right, the chance now to ask questions of any of our first group of speakers. Um, if you have a question, stick your hand up. Uh, we'll get our microphone to you in this hall. 
Uh, or you can use a slide of up, as I was telling you before, um, if you don't fancy actually asking the question in person. Um, if you get the microphone, can you identify yourself first, please, and then ask your question? So, who wants to go first? Nobody ever wants to go first, but somebody has to. God, that's a quiet crowd in this morning. Thank you very much, sir. Can we get a microphone for that gentleman there over today? Stick your hand up again, please. No. Please just come up behind you. Thank you. Hi, Scott Ogilvy here, the VP for Digital Project Product Management at Wood. I've got a question, James. So, as you move to values, as you move to values, James, how are you going to articulate the value and track and report that against for the business? And how do you get the key stakeholders to play their role in that so that you know they're committed to getting you to that value? So uh, what, we've, what we've done there is we have a very clear five-year strategy right now that's articulated. What that's based on is we have an outcomes roadmap rather than a project roadmap. We're delivering capabilities, not digital systems. So asset management, uh, inspection management, uh, work order management, uh, how do we do better field safety reporting, so for us, it's that articulation of the outcomes using the traditional agile module model. Don't talk about the technology, talk about what the value is. So that's been uh, quite a heavy engagement. Last year when I joined, I was handed this digital strategy and the, and the managing director said, go look at it and tell us what it needs if it needs more. And so by July, we represented the whole digital strategy into a value stream model. At the time, it was a submission to Ofgem of here's the projects we want to do. That was, then, that was all translated into outcome-driven uh, uh, capabilities. Through long engagement with those directors, they chair with me their monthly meetings on progress around are we delivering the capability. The value case is more about that than, well, if we do this thing, we're going to save one pound per day per, per person. We've really shifted the dialogue to there. So they own the strategy. My conversations with them is, are we on track to what you want to do with your business? We simultaneously have a change team who are working with us on where, where, how do we drive change, whether it's at process level. So we, we, we're kind of working as a triumvirate with each of the directors, but it's about the outcomes. And that's the only way you can have those conversations. I was curious, when you, when you were talking about what was happening within your company, it, I mean, it's a huge level of change, it's a huge level of investment, there's a lot of people involved, you, you, you're bringing a lot of people on board at the same time. How do you... How do you ensure that all those actions are actually safe actions? That you're not putting the company at risk by pushing forward change? Uh, well, so again, being a national infrastructure operator, there's, you, safety is an important part of our business. But safe change of changing the business and the business processes, it, I think that's a really, it's a really interesting dialogue we've, we've had and we continue to have is what is the capacity for change? in a rapidly expanding organization where not am I only just hiring, but every director is hiring, there's new people coming in. What would, what the, the key point to me is when we have that conversation is it, there's a finite capacity of resources both in the business to be engaged in requirements and if we're into time boxes and sprints. So what we're doing with the program, the, the capability uh, and the outcomes roadmap is, is a living plan. It moves left and right. When, when I've, first presented it back to actually the CEO who's fully committed to digital change, it was really important that we said, this is not a fixed set of outcomes, it has to stretch. And even on Tuesday with the management team, we were looking at the roadmap saying, we, may, we need to make it a bit thinner and longer and, and stop bunching it to the left. Everyone wants to get everything done because you're capturing outcomes and value sooner, but you have to let it breathe, otherwise you, you, you will crater the business. So, so it's consciously, actively managing that dialogue is what I do. Okay, questions coming on slightly. Uh, for Sandy and Malcolm. What's your bring your own device policy for employees? And do you allow all your staff to access your services on their own device? I can, <clears throat> I can probably talk to the adoption side of things and how it's going. I wonder if Steve wants to touch first on the behind the scenes policy and I can talk about the, the barriers or how successful it's been. Uh, yeah, yes, we do. Um, it, it's not a full range of services, so we're, we're um, selective about what services we push out. Um, we have it on our, our, a range of different service areas and, and some of that is um, 
formal uh, engagement, which Sandy can speak about, and some of that is the more ad hoc things. So individuals with a preference to, to a particular way of working or a particular device or, or dare I say it, um, operating system choice. So yeah, yes, we do. It's an interesting one because before the pandemic hit, we were in a massive drive to encourage people to use their own device. So as Steve says, um, there's a limited range of using your own device. So you can use your own smartphone or tablet, but not your own desktop or, or laptop computer. Um, so before the pandemic, there was a massive push from us to encourage people to use their own device. And there's a specific user group we're targeting with that that I'll talk about in a second. But when the pandemic hit, it was no longer that essential. We no longer had um, office workers who were as mobile as they had been and needed to use their own device. So there wasn't the same drive for it. I would say it's possibly true to say we've not pushed it as heavily since then. Um, and I would sort of add to that, that our most mobile workers are always given work devices anyway. They will always have a, um, a work phone or a work tablet so they can work on the go anyway. The specific user group we're targeting that we have a particular interest in is our frontline workers. So we have 1,500 of our most frontline workers who work in um, cleaning, parks and gardens, catering, um, cleaning all across the city. And up until um, two years ago, these employees had no, in fact, less than that, about 18 months ago, these employees had no access to any of our digital systems. We introduced the um, F1 license through Microsoft 365, which gives them a reduced ability to um, to access different apps and it's those employees that we are particularly targeting for the BYOD, bring your own device policy and that we're really experiencing some, some challenges with. There's, there's fear because of the monitoring we need to put in place behind the scenes that um, employees feel that their devices are being monitored. So there's a barrier to overcome there to enable us to be able to communicate with frontline workers in the way that we want to, so that managers can push out notifications to their team members and not have to rely on notice boards and canteens. So it's, it's a challenge that we're, we're working on just now, but it's definitely high on our agenda. Are they? Are, are, they? are there devices being monitored? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, so, so there are things we need to control in terms of making sure that, that it's a safe connection and we understand what's being done. Uh, but it's that concern that you know we, that some somebody in my service will be scrolling through pictures on their devices or whatever. That's simply not the case, and, and, and would never be the case. So we need them to sign up to Microsoft Intune in order to get the apps installed on their their phone. And even that is a kind of level of complexity too far for them, for, for some employees. They just mm -hmm. don't want to do their, that. They just want to be able to go to the app store, download Teams, download the Yammer, and be able to communicate instantly. And we can't do that. We need to be able to protect the data that employees are accessing mm -hmm. on their device. So they need to install Intune, and then they need to go through a, a protocol to install it. And it's just, it's just that, that barrier of complexity is preventing full adoption, I'd say. Both Malcolm and Tanya are nodding away at that. Yeah, so, so I, I would agree that what these guys are doing is the, is the, is the right approach, um, allowing people to be enabled to access their data. But the problems come with data loss prevention and protection when you do that, right, and how you, you manage that. So we have to rethink that strategy as well. So at the moment, we, we deploy defences on our, edge devi or our end user devices, in some instances, to so, sort of monitor and try and control data loss, because obviously you're trying to protect your company's IP, right? You know, there's a misconception that um, people own the data they work on. They don't. The organization, they, the organization they work for own that data. It's that organization's intellectual property, unless you've got an exception in your, in your contract. But most of your contracts, everyone sitting here today has a contract of employment. That will have an IP clause in there that says you cannot take the company data away with you, right? So how do you control that on a device that you don't own, right? You have to move those defenses back into your edge appliances and your edge solutions. So edge solutions are things like, you know, your file servers, your, your SharePoint access, your Teams access. You've got to move that protection layer back in there, and that's where you're monitoring it from. So the end user isn't being monitored on their own device. They're being monitored on your infrastructure, and that's where you need to put that layer of defense in, okay? And those tools are available already. You can do that today. You know, so anybody who's building out a portfolio that allows to bring your own device, they will be implementing that. So the end user is assured that they're not being monitored. So you can't see any personal stuff they're doing on their own device. But you can certainly see what's going on with your own information and data. Another question's come in on Slater, Tanya. I'm going to put to you. Digital transformation, as you said, you know, in year one, you would like nine companies involved. Now you've shot up to 23. 
I was going to ask you why you thought that had happened. This probably ties in. Yes, no transfer is a strategic imperative, but not all leaders are as well engaged. What tips do you have to get leaders aligned to this imperative? Other than a big stick. <laughs> I think, um, so talking first about, I suppose, those companies, I think it was just um, a lot of um, open dialogue, as I, as I mentioned, I think. Um, and also, they learned that when they didn't engage with the test period first, it led to a lot of pain. So I think, uh, um, yeah, uh, and we made a few changes. So I think they, um, they thought we better get on this. We better have a look at it. Um, I think in terms of um, uh, leaders being well engaged, I think when I think of our, our own leaders uh, at the NSTA, I think that's been a, a lot of hard work and a, a lot of uh, a lot of communication. I think we also have really good um, systems in place now. I think one of the challenges we face is that, as I think most organizations, uh, IT, digital and data, there's a lot of demand and we can't do everything. And I think people switch off, they go, you know, why can't you do it faster? Um, we've got uh, a really strong uh, PMO process now. Uh, we are rolling Agile out through our organization as well. Um, and through uh, aspects of Agile, such as being able to deliver MVP, minimum viable product, or delivering something that they can see first and then working on it, I think we're able to, to get people a bit more bought in rather than just saying, no, you know, we haven't got time to deal with your project, go away. Um, I think. Uh, we don't have time to deal with your project, uh, this is why, or we can deliver this for you, um, and now we need to move on. Um, and I think that really has an impact with, uh, you know, with the whole organization, but it's, um, it's really meant that our leadership team are, are brought in. That second question down in the slide of this, uh, what incentives are there for your digital champions? Certainly, yeah. Uh, just, just to add a little bit to what Tanya said, is of that as well about engaging leaders is if you don't have engaged leaders the service won't follow we've absolutely mm -hmm. found that like the entire department won't follow if it's if it's not adopted right at the top and it really has implications further down the line and eventually and as tanya says those implications will catch up with them so because we're now layering on top of teams with dynamics 365 it means that our areas of the council that haven't fully embraced Microsoft Teams are now having this almost like cliff edge of really <coughs> needing to upskill extremely quickly. Um, so it's, it's, it's absolutely critical and I think Tanya's touched on some, some, some great tips there. Incentives for digital champions. It's a difficult one. I mean, we're, we're a public sector organization. We don't have any money. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we, we, can't, we can't afford to pay bonuses and incentives, right? So it's, it's a difficult one. And the incentive, um, from our point of view, has really got to be their, their goodwill. And that's why people are volunteering is so important. It's got to be people who are motivated um, to upskill their, pe their peers, people who love change, people who love digital. These are your go-to people. Like the most obvious people that emerge, those are the ones that will be most rewarded by the incentives that we can offer. So the sort of incentives that we would offer is, is things like trying out the latest tech, being part of pilot projects, when there's new things being rolled out, they're absolutely at the forefront of that. We would run thank you sessions with the, um, with the director and invite their line managers along. We would hold specific sessions for their line managers. We would recognize them visibly on the intranet. Every single piece of communication that would go out so would say huge thanks to our super champs. Click, click the links to find out who your super champ is in your area. So just constantly um, recognizing what they were doing. And literally that's, that's all we could do. And it's not not worked. It, it's worked quite well. I think over the period that we've had super champs in place, which is probably, I mean, what's the length of the, the pandemic? Probably about two and a half years now. We've probably had a drop off about 10 people off about 60 people. And we have more super champions um, joining us as we move into Dynamics 365 now as well. So, so not a huge, a huge drop off. Going back to your first point about, you know, you, you need executive buy-in. You know, there's an old saying in show business, sincerity, once you can fake that, you can fake anything. Um, do you get that with senior managers? So yes, digital, I love digital, I, I breathe digital, blah, 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 but they're actually, their heart's not really in it, they don't want to do it. Yeah. 
definitely, and you could feel it from the get-go. One of the very first things we did um, as part of scaling up and rolling out SharePoint teams was one-to-one -one meetings with all the chief officers, um, sort of coaching conversations to understand their approach to change, irrespective of what the change is, just how do they feel about change. And you could feel it there and then. You would know the ones that wouldn't really be on, on board with it. And the proof was kind of in the pudding. And we can do as much as we can do in terms of um, encouragement, support, training. Um, building a momentum is so important. So I think like the theory goes that once you get 20% of a population on board, the rest will follow. So the aim is always like, who are the keenest chief officers that we can get on board? And then hopefully the rest will follow. But, but not always. And do people talk a good game? Absolutely. Yes, you'll have head nodding. Yes, people see theoretically why it's a really good idea. But in a lot of instances, people can rise to the top without a huge amount of technical knowledge or not technical knowledge, but digital expertise, and asking them to make that shift is, is really quite a lot. So I suppose, what's the baby step they could make? What's the smallest thing they could do that would encourage their people to, to hop on board? Okay. Any more questions from the floor? We've got them stacking up in slider, which is fine. This seems to be the approved method of getting in contact at the moment. Um, when exposing data to multiple parties for their needs, what approaches do you use to balance openness with security slash privacy? Who wants to take that? Okay. Um, so, uh, certainly from uh, an Aberdeen City Council point of view, we um, have a robust approach to uh, data protection and it's a dedicated service within the organisation. Everything um, in terms of information has an information asset owner. Uh, and any agreement to share or, or make data available to other parties uh, has to go through that process, has to have a DPIA, has to be approved by an information asset owner, and there has to be a reason um, for that need to share and a purpose at the end of it as well. So probably from a, a local authority point of view, that, that's a fairly well-trodden path, um, and, and certainly one, I think, that, that does give us that balance uh, between openness and security and privacy. Again, I'm just going to run through these. As stated, recruitment is a big challenge. What, what advice would you give non-techie people looking to get into a digital career to improve the skills pipeline? James, any thoughts on that? I, actually, yes. I, th I think, you know, <clears throat> a lot of companies, and myself included, is it's not always a pure play IT person we're looking for. Uh, when you're trying to move fast and innovate, what do you bring to the table? It's, it's game changing in terms of your attitude or your mindset or your previous experiences. So when, when I look at recruiting certain roles within my organization, it's, it's have you got good project management discipline? If that's a good thing, we can teach the rest. And, and I think that's the key point is how do you differentiate yourself if you don't necessarily have all the IT skills? Sure, you can do self-learning around some of the jargon phrases of agile and such like, but, but for me to move into this and become part of the skills pipeline, I think you can position yourself with the skills you may have and how it becomes a compelling proposition to the employer. It's not that hard. There are some interesting agencies out there and when we are beginning to use them, there's one in Glasgow called FDM that uses return to work um, military people coming into Civvy Street. They're also doing return to work um, uh, gender diversity where they're looking at people who have been on long-term parental leave bringing them back. So we're actively recruiting people who may have been off the shelf for a little while, but they've got all the skills we need. So, so I think it's also being aware of how do you get to those necessary agencies that actually are really able to train you. They also do graduate recruits where they take the graduates and they teach them how to answer a phone, how to show up and dress appropriately. So there's agencies out there that are trying to create that rounded service to inject talent into an industry that's completely starved of, of resources. It's interesting, I, I did a programme a few years ago about uh, raising the Russian nuclear submarine of Kursk and I was talking to a diving superintendent um, and he said to me, all these guys can dive, I couldn't care less about the diving skills, I assume I take that for granted. He says, what I want to know is, what can they do while they dive? Your industry seems to be in exactly the same position at the moment. Yeah, it's not just a case of pushing the buttons or being able to code or whatever the hell it is. It's c can you do everything else in a more rounded sense? Um, there's a couple of questions that came up with me. Um, let me just get this one here.
staff resistance to change, which we, we kind of discussed you know, at the same time. You were talking about people who are working in parks, people who are working in cleaners, blah, blah, blah. Why do they need to be digitally connected? So I suppose during the pandemic, the, the imperative for community, communicating with frontline staff became, it became even more clear. So it was no longer the case that staff could come into the canteen and read a notice board. In a lot of instances, it was no longer the case that line managers could meet with frontline workers to communicate anything to them at all. Any shift changes, of which there were a lot, our frontline staff were absolutely critical and maxed out, and you know, overtime was needed during the pandemic. You know, how do you reach out to these employees who are often unwilling to give you their, their phone number? So how do you reach these employees to let them know that there are shifts available? The challenge was, was extraordinary. So from a frontline manager's point of view, they could really see what the incentive would be. And so frontline managers have been incredibly bought in, incredibly willing and supportive of any campaigns, um, particularly waste and recycling, I'd say, have just been mind-blowing in how, how enthusiastic they've been to adopt. From a very frontline person's point of view, um, resistance to change, um, in some instances, where there's extra shifts available, that's enough of a hook. But we can't reach them all. It's really difficult to reach out to 1,500 frontline workers and let them know why it's so great to have um, to, to install Microsoft Teams in your device. And even teaching them how to install it is a challenge in itself. So we're just about to embark on our next level of engagement with the frontline, which is just turning up at the depots and understanding the resist resistance to change. We understand resistance anecdotally at the moment, but we're not hearing it direct from the guys and they're not getting the opportunity to, to ask us and you know feel a bit silly in front of their, their workmates. So that's, that's the next step, is going out directly to people. Nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Um, Decades ago, when I was a student, um, I worked at a summer job as a scatter. And um, they sent along, in those days, it was um, time and motion studies. And they sent along guys to actually monitor what the scatters did. Now, to be honest, normally we would be finished by lunchtime. And in those days, they painted the scatter wagons on us so you couldn't hide them in the countryside. Um, but they, they still found places to hide them in the countryside. I had, for that whole week, we had time and motion people with us. I had never got out of a lorry so slowly or so carefully. I had never replaced a bin more carefully. I'd never put the lid back on more carefully. And all the time I was being watched by the guys who did this full time to make sure that I, as a student, didn't cock it up and go too fast. So, as I say, nothing new under the sun. Chance for one more question if there's anything from the floor. No? Okay, right. In which case, can I ask you to thank our first five speakers one more time, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> Refreshments are now going to be served uh, next door in Conference Suite 2B. Take the time if you can to visit the exhibition stands. Uh, the next session starts at 11.30 and will be run as breakouts. Uh, your breakouts are actually noted on the back of your badge. Uh, lunch will then be served at 12.40 in Conference Suite 2B and the final session will begin at 1.30 here. Uh, stay on please for the final session, we've got some great speakers at, um, and from Ecometrica, Aria, Brewdog and TL Tech. Thank you very much, go and get your coffee. Thanks very much.